me. I, it, this is a, a really cool uh, workshop, and being here, I was um, just kind of having flashbacks of taking your course, sitting in the up there at the MBA o, o course here at, at MIT. So it's it's kind of it's cool to be back. And um, in a lot of ways, uh, so Cambrian Innovation, we're, we're an environmental product development firm, and I started it uh, between my uh, master's and my PhD, as Ollie said. And uh, in a lot of ways, it was uh, Ollie who encouraged me. Uh, to keep going with it after I started it, even though I was doing the PhD, so I have, so so I, you know, thank you for that, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, I think what I'm going to do here is uh, give kind of an overview of Cambrian Innovation, uh, and then I'm going to talk about bioelectrochemical systems, which are kind of a new class of of technologies that are very exciting in a lot of ways. Um, and then I'm going to speak a little bit about bioelectrochemical systems for life support, and some of the work that we've done uh, in that area. And finally, um, talk a little bit about um, the potential for doing kind of open source science. This is something that uh, Charlie and I talked about very briefly, but uh, it's something I think is pretty exciting. Uh, it, it could be applied to what we're developing in Cambrian, but also uh, in some ways uh, probably to any, any kind of scientific experiments. And, um, and I encourage you, if you guys have any questions while I'm speaking, uh, just interrupt me. It's, it's late in the day, so you know, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully you'll be able to grasp most of what I'm saying, but if I speak too quickly, let me know. Um, so Cambrian Innovation, we were founded in 2006. We're a, uh, as I said, environmental product development firm. We have a core competence in bioelectrochemical systems. Uh, and um, our mission and our, our sort of vision is to use advanced technology and advanced biology to solve basic resource problems, particularly at the intersection of energy and water. So we're doing that outside of aerospace largely, but we also have some projects uh, with NASA um, uh, that, that I think are, are really fun to work on and pretty exciting in a lot of ways in terms of their implications. Um, we're, uh, just to give you a little more background, we're a venture-backed firm. We have uh, 15 full-time equivalents right now. Uh, we have a 3,500-square-foot lab and prototyping space in the Innovation District uh, in Boston. Um, and along the way, over the last couple of years, we've, we've been able to win a number of awards uh, both on the grant side and in terms of business plan competitions, which has helped us uh, as well as, as uh, you know, get uh, seed investment, angel investment, and, and a, what's called the Series A investment, which is usually your sort of first round of, of equity financing. Um, wanted to give you just kind of a brief overview of where our company has been just to, to situate it. Uh, we were started in 2006. I was between my master's and my PhD. And what I have here is sort of the black line is when the co-founders and I, my, my fellow co-founder is a bioengineer, uh, PhD uh, fit, um, from MIT. And uh, we were sort of both in school in the black line and then out of school in the green line. So the, the first part was when we were still uh, uh, sort of a group that was um, at MIT largely and sort of working out of different places. We were able to get grants from, from NASA and the USDA. Uh, and then right at the end there won something called the Ignite Clean Energy Prize, which is kind of which is a business plan competition, uh, and they have a lot of those uh, around MIT. There's the 100K and the Ignite. Now that's called the Clean Tech Open. Um, and uh, after that, we uh, went full time and we started focusing in large part on applied R&D uh, and trying to get some funding from from different government sources, including um, the NSF. And we got a couple of new NASA projects which are going right now, which I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about, uh, as well as some projects with the EPA. Um, and one with the uh, with the U.S. Army, which is hey, hey Matt, when yeah. you were a, a graduate student at MIT, did they have some sort of uh, competitions that enabled you to get funding and, and encourage entrepreneurship directly from MIT? Uh, yeah, there was so there was the hundred K, okay. um, and the hundred K we were actually in the aerospace track technically because we had gotten funding from the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts, which funds sort of oh, yeah. back back before it was shut down and then it restarted. Um, and we got ten thousand dollars from them. Okay, well, what I was on. getting at was specifically from MIT because I know at NYU Poly they started these things even with undergraduate students to get them thinking about that even as undergraduates. Are. Yeah, I, so I think undergrads do participate in the hundred K. I'm not sure if the hundred K is funded by MIT or it's outside, but or it's, it's, okay. the it's organized. Right, yeah, right, right. And that's, how, that's how it works. But it's an example of of. Um, kind of competitions spurring innovation and the recognition of competitions. And, and it's very powerful in a lot of ways. It, gets, it galvanizes a community. I think the Centennial Challenges program at NASA was trying to capture some of that. You know, yeah, in the X Prize, exactly. So, 
Um, so that's a little bit of background on our company. Uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the problem that we're focused on outside of aerospace before talking about life support in aerospace. Um, we're focused on uh, w essentially water treatment or the intersection of energy and water. And how many of uh, people here are sort of familiar with the basic technologies of, involved with water treatment? I'm assuming not many. Yeah, some. Okay, good. So everybody knows that that basically, if we're talking about sort of biological water treatment, um, there's two basic approaches. You have, you have a polluted water, which is high in usually biological oxygen demand or chemical oxygen demand. Then you're going to have solids that also need to be removed. So you have a waste. You have a source in sort of the industrial infrastructure. What you're first going to do. Is, is put it through some kind of clarification or separation, the solids from sort of the liquid stream, and that's something that, that also needs to happen to a certain extent uh, in space. Uh, and then you're going to have a solid st stream and a liquid stream. You're going to put the more liquid stream, the more sort of dissolved carbon, through what's called aerobic digestion. And that is pretty simple. It's basically bubbling air through a reactor and having microbes that consume the dissolved carbon and, they, and their aerobic microbes. Because they're aerobic, they tend to grow more quickly. They get more energy out of the food. And so you end up with a lot of uh, additional solids, essentially. And both the solids from clarification and the solids from the aerobic digestion need to be put into some uh, form of uh, anaerobic digestion, usually to reduce those. So those are the basic technologies that you're looking at when you're dealing with wastewater treatment. Um, there's about 40 billion gallons of wastewater generated every single day in the US. That's about uh, enough to fill close to 100,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Um, so there's a massive amount of waste produced from agricultural, industrial, and municipal sources. And we're only treating a fraction of that. So a lot of it ends up in places like the Chesapeake Bay or the Mississippi River and ends up uh, becoming a huge problem. One of the reasons we only treat a fraction of that is that the aerobic portion is extremely expensive. Uh, and that's because it's very energy intensive. So the, the estimates are that about 2 to 3% of the electricity in the US is actually consumed through municipal plants doing aerobic digestion. Um, and so at the same time, uh, the, the, the sort of dissolved carbon, as well as the solids, um, have actually energy in them. The, the bugs can use them, and there's ways that we can get energy from that as well. So this is a, a very high-level schematic of the technology that we're developing. It's called uh, bioelectrochemical systems. Uh, also known as microbial fuel cells. And it's based on a discovery about 10 years ago of microbes that have the ability to directly respirate to insoluble metals in their environment, or respire, rather, to insoluble metals in their environment. So they're able to attach to metals uh, and donate electrons directly to them. And they do that because they have actually, um, what you can see in the picture there, is these pili, they're the external parts, that are uh, electrically, electrically conductive. So they're essentially breathing to the metals. And they evolved to do that in places where uh, there wasn't a lot of energy to be had, but there were sort of uh, iron deposits that they could reduce. So they, they evolved to sort of reduce iron from Fe3 to Fe2. And um, what we can do, actually, is, is grow biofilms of these microbes uh, and put them on electrodes. And they act as true catalysts if you give them any kind of organic source. So they can actually use hydrogen as a, an organic source, or they can use uh, waste, dissolved carbon in wastewater. Um, yeah? This is more like a fuel cell, like a hydrogen fuel cell. Okay. So if you can think of it exactly like a hydrogen fuel cell, where you've got an anode and a cathode. Uh, and then in this case, usually in hydrogen fuel cells, you have a precious metal catalyst, which is going to speed up the rate of the reaction. So you have an oxidation reaction and then a reduction reaction at the cathode. In this case, the way this schematic is shown, we've got the oxidation, reduction, uh, the oxidation reaction at the anode being catalyzed by these biofilms. So you basically have like a coat of these biofilms on the electrode. And they're able to act essentially as the catalyst for things that, for a more complex and wide range of, of fuels, if you will, uh, than just a regular fuel cell. And so this is, it, it, the um, was, was kind of a breakthrough discovery in a lot of ways. What people have found since then is that these microbes are actually present more widely than people thought, or the capability to uh, respire directly to, uh, to electrodes is, is more prevalent than people thought. They just didn't think to look for it uh, as much. And um, 
Some of the typical sort of numbers that people have looked at is that in terms of treatment rates, um, we've gotten them to from one to six kilograms of BOD per meter cube day. That compares very favorably with aerobic digestion, which is typically below five kilograms per meter uh, cube day. Uh, in terms of power densities, the power densities are not terribly high. If you compare them to fuel cells, uh, we have between two, 200 and, uh, excuse me, between 20 and 100 watts per meter cubed. Um, and that's a low power density, but if you consider the fact that the aerobic part of the treatment process is actually consuming an enormous amount of energy, the net difference is pretty big. Yeah? So the electrons are coming from the fuel. They're coming from the dissolved carbon. So generally what you've got is a complex organic molecule that's being oxidized to carbon dioxide. And in the process, it's uh, releasing a fair amount of electrons. So that, that's how they're, the, the, in some ways, the microbes are eating the, 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 the food. They're getting the energy from the electrons. But then they have to get rid of them. And that's the, that's the breathing process. It's kind of like when we breathe in oxygen and out carbon dioxide, we're reducing, you know, oxygen CO2. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the way they, they're getting energy. Yeah, <laughs> it is pretty. <laughs> hey, hey, Matt, is, on one side of this, you're taking dirty water and you're cleaning it. The other side, you're producing pure water? In this case, yeah. In this case, yeah, because you have the hydrogen going over it. Yeah, so in this case, what we have is just like a fuel cell yeah. will produce yeah, So you generate water. very clean water. Now, when this dirty water becomes but cleaner and cleaner, does it? it's not as useful anymore? When this dirty water becomes, well, the goal is to get it cleaner and cleaner, to reduce the right, DOD. Right. Once it's low, yeah, it'll have less energy in it. Okay, so but it, it, the amount of energy output gets less and less. Yeah. It? Okay. Wait, so yeah, essentially. You're cleaning the water and you're we can exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we we get we get uh, electricity. You're two for one, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what we're doing. We're treating the water, and then we're getting electricity. And what, what our goal is, you know, the electricity is not terribly high, but if we can power the system itself to make it self-powered, that's actually a big kind of strategic <laughs> advantage. And and it also it, it can have uh, just decoupling the water from the energy side of things can have a lot of advantages from a from a robustness standpoint as well. Um, so that's absolutely, in this case, that's what we're doing. We're treating it just like a fuel cell. We're, we're producing water, but we're also consuming oxygen. So that's something to, to think about. Um, now, this was sort of the original discoveries that were made in 1999. There was a lot of research that went into this. Um, since then, we've discovered some really cool things uh, as well, which is that just like there's microbes that can oxidize dissolved carbon at an anode, there's actually microbes that can accept electrons from a cathode and synthesize products. And they're essentially using the electrons from the cathode as an energy source, and then they need to get rid of them the same way anything that ferments will, will ferment to methane or will ferment to these different things. And we've actually found that you can produce a whole range of different products uh, with depending on the biofilm that you produce. Um, we've shown direct production of methane, basically taking a biofilm, feeding it electricity, and reducing carbon dioxide directly to methane uh, gas in a very uh, a pretty simple reaction, which mimics, which I'll get into, some of the things that happen on the space station with this FITA uh, reactor. Um, but people have also shown that you can produce acetate, ethanol, and there's people working on producing butanol. And you can think of this as a way of producing uh, fuel, essentially, from uh, a wastewater source or from an electron source and waste carbon dioxide. So there's a whole range of things that, that people are looking at, and it's, it's a, a pretty flexible uh, technological platform in a lot of ways. So I just wanted to show an example of some, one of the kind of industrial products that we're developing for this before getting into the, uh, the, the NASA-related work. Um, we have funding from the National Science Foundation to build a system that can do what's called denitrification. Is, is everybody here familiar with denitrification? No? Somewhat? Okay. Probably not. Probably not. Okay. So when you're uh, one of the difficult things to remove from wastewater is ammonia, uh, and generally to remove ammonia, what you need to do is you need to nitrify it, and when you nitrify it, you end up with a lot of nitrates, uh, and that's a diff another difficult thing to remove. Um, when you have a lot of nitrates but not a lot of carbon, essentially, what you usually need to do to do denitrification is you need to add back in a, a carbon source, 
And what that means is that the microbes need, need to feed on something, and then they use the nitrates as their terminal electron acceptor. So they're essentially uh, getting rid of the nitrates as, uh, in, in the same way that they're getting rid of oxygen when they're, when they're growing. So that's actually very, exp now industry needs to do denitri nitrification, denitrification. Uh, and particularly in this niche that we're looking at, uh, the fish farming industry ha produces a fair amount of ammonia, and they want to they want to close the loop, essentially on their on their fish farms in the same way that NASA wants to close close the loop uh, with respect to its resources. To do that, they need to nitrify and denitrify. And what we've developed is a system that can essentially do denitrification at a cathode. So if we run a nitrate-rich stream past our cathode, we can get a biofilm that grows that's capable of doing denitrification. Uh, and consuming electrons directly from electrode and, uh, from the electrode in that process, that removes the need to add carbon into the system, and that say, can save them a ton of money. We we're estimating, you know, something like seventy percent savings compared to the competing uh, denitrification technology. And, and so, and yeah, Matt, I thought one of the ladies that that spoke about uh, waste um, cleansing was talking about, uh, I thought microbes that actually feed on the ammonia. You can have that as well. So those generally, a microbe that will feed on the ammonia is going to need oxygen, at, at it, it, because it's going to generate the nitrates. So so you'll need to have once you have get rid of all the oxygen, uh, or even once once they they've consumed all the ammonia, then you've got microbes. Then you've got nitrates, but it's very hard to get rid of that because microbes would prefer. This gets into a little bit of microbial physiology, but the microbes would prefer to use the oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. They get more energy out of that than the nitrates. So what you generally have to do then is take that water, make it anaerobic, and then you need to and then add a carbon source because microbes need to grow on something. So in the case of denitrification, there's sort of two things you need to think about with respect to the microbes. One is that they're going to feed on something, they're going to oxidize something, and the other is that they're going to ferment something or they're going to use something as their terminal electron acceptor. And that those are sort of the, that's sort of the energetic process by which the microbes grow. And so in the case of of nitrification, they're feeding on the ammonia, and they're using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. Then, in the case of denitrification, they, need, they, they are going to use the nitrates as the terminal electron acceptor, but they need to feed on something else. And that's why you have to add a food in there, generally. So it ends up being pretty expensive. Yeah. But it's the same microbe, you said. No, in that case, there's different populations, the nitrifiers and denitrifiers. Now, there's actually a process in uh, industry that people are looking at. It's called Anamox. And it basically is the is, it's the direct oxidation of ammonia without the generation of nitrates. So oxidation of ammonia to nitrogen gas, um, and that's a, that's something that people haven't fully figured out yet. But if they could, it would be a good thing. <laughs> so, um, so this is an example we did in in our phase one project with uh, the NSF. Is we partnered with uh, a local fish farm. Actually, is the biggest uh, indoor aquaculture facility in the U.S. is located in Massachusetts. Uh, we partnered with them and got some of their culture tank water, some of the water that they used, and wanted to show that if we, if we built the right system, we could essentially do denitrification. We were successful in showing that we got the nitrates down to below EPA limits in a very short time period. And we also showed that, if you look here, if this works, we could generate electricity directly. So that this is um, what you're seeing here is basically the first time that a system has generated electricity directly from uh, the nitrates in a, in, a, in a real industrial wastewater stream. And, uh, and you can imagine, this is a pretty small system. That's, that, the amount of energy there is, is more than enough to power a small pump to put it through that system itself. And as you scale it, it should, it should stay constant. So, so it's, it's the pump itself. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> Sounds like a Rube Goldberg machine, but it's not. <laughs> You're getting the energy out of the fuel. So, uh, so that's an example of some of the things that we're doing on the, uh, on the industrial side. What I wanted to talk about a little bit now is, is yeah? What is, what is the cost? And what is the cost benefit equation? Doesn't that work into? Yeah, that's, a, yeah. That's, the, that's the whole critical part. So like for the denitrification? Or for the wastewater treatment, have you done any economics? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So we've done, uh, we've had to do pretty extensive economics, interviewing a number of customers and seeing what their cost is, and how much we can save them. And uh, the seventy percent number comes from those analyses. So we can save them 
on the carbon addition, on the energy, on to a certain extent because they're reusing the water. They uh, don't need to salt the water as much. They don't need to uh, heat it uh, as much. They're, so they're saving across the board by closing the loop. Um, also improve their corporate image. That counts for, for something to a certain extent because they're not polluting as much. And all of that 70% then needs to justify the capital expense of the system. Right? So that ends up being something like uh, $100,000 a year or more for that customer. Um, and for a corporate sort of responsibility type project, they're generally okay with something like a five year to six year return. Uh, so that's, then you can think about the cost that we have to hit. It's about five hundred to $600,000 for an installed system on discounted for, for what it's worth without thinking about the time costs of money. But uh, so that's the target cost. And, and if we can make it for that, they'll buy it. Uh, and that's, a, that's the challenge. Just if. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But we think we can. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, the interesting thing in this uh, space in particular is that a lot of the costs go into custom engineering. So you've got usually the, the engineering costs in an industrial project like that are about two times the cost of the actual equipment. So you're going to spend twice as much on engineering labor and design as you would on, on the equipment. And um, uh, what, one of the things that we're going to try to do is reduce that engineering, the non-recurring engineering costs essentially by, by designing very modular systems. And what about the, uh, the, the, the microbes? They're, they're crucial. You've got to keep these little guys alive, right? Yeah. Um, and so survivability, longevity. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to get to that, okay. actually. But it's, it's, it's a particular thing. The, the cool thing is with these systems, we have a biofilm-based process. Um, biofilms are one of the notoriously most difficult things to get rid of. Uh, in, in sort of industrial processes. People try to get rid of biofilms and they can't. So we have an extremely robust community. If we build it right, it's, it's, uh, it, it actually, the, the detriments of normal biofilms are working to our advantage. How do you keep the accumulation of Yeah. It, it, so there's two, two things to be said about that. Um, one is that we actually accumulate much less biomass and we grow much less biomass particularly on the cathode, but also on the anode, than uh, comparable uh, approaches. And the reason is because we're getting most of the energy out of the, uh, out of the oxidation reduction reaction. The microbes are getting very little. They might get 5% of the energy associated with the potential drop across uh, the anode and cathode, and they're not going to grow that quickly. They're actually going to get about as much energy as they would through any anaerobic process. And if we do it right, they can get a little bit less, and that'll mean the, that means they'll grow less quickly. So in terms of the, the buildup of biomass. I, I, I guess I would have thought that if you build the thing based, for lack of a better word, yes, that the microbes don't eat your microbes. Well, that, that's about right. But um, if you look at, so the energy they get is the difference between the, uh, the sort of um, free, the sort of gives free energy of what's, go, you know, of the fuel and the potential of the anode electrode, right? That's the difference that they're getting. And so what we're actually getting is the difference between the anode electrode and the cathode. That's what we're getting. That ends up being much more. So, so we end up getting more energy than, than, the, uh, than the microbes get. It's, it's surprising, but it, it ends up being, they end up, you know, you can compare it to any anaerobic process, which means that we're, we're building up, the, the, the word is a cell yield. The cell yield is, is lower. Um, so that's the first point. But then with respect to the buildup, um, the, the cool thing about the technology is that the microbes that are closest to the electrodes are actually healthiest because those are the ones who, that are, they're kind of, they actually move and try to crowd in to the electrode. And so they're pushing out uh, dead microbes essentially. So any solids, if you have sort of a flow through system, are naturally just going to get pushed out of the system while maintaining a healthy biofilm. So that's from a, Maintenance standpoint is a is a good thing. But. So, <laughs> um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about sort of the projects that we've done for NASA and uh, some of the areas where this this could be interesting. Um, this is a, a a simplification of the sort of ISS water loop, um, as far as we understand it. Uh, there may be some things here and there you guys could point out. I don't know if Bob could point out that. This is, uh, I hope this is fully accurate in your mind. You, 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 okay, good. <laughs> um, and uh, so basically what you have is, uh, you know, you have a UPA, uh, urine process assembly distillate, as well as some other humidity concept, some other 
uh, sort of sources that go in. Uh, and then you're, you're going to have separators and particulate filters. Are you guys familiar with this? Did you already talk about it already? Yeah. You did? OK. So you're familiar with how, how that all works. So then it ties back, to some extent, the potable water ties back into the uh, oxygen generation system. Um, what we pointed out in a couple of our projects, one is that if you, if you remember that we can generate electricity, but we can also generate value-added products with our system, we wanted to look at the potential to put a, 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 a system that could basically generate a number of those different products right before the separators and particulate filters, so take uh, on the ISS. Now, if you were going to design a system from scratch, is this how you would design it if you had bioelectrochemical systems? Probably not, because there isn't a whole lot of fuel or BOD going into this water treatment system compared to uh, what, what you might want to do if you're going to try to close the loop further. But uh, we wanted to look at a system that could generate from that BOD a range of different outputs. And we wanted to show that we could do that in real time. So we could basically generate uh, electricity and water, but also generate um, uh, methane and water, which is that reaction I was talking about earlier. And there's another reaction where we can also generate hydrogen. Uh, and that's similar to electrolysis, but it takes a lot less energy than electrolysis. That was one. We wanted to sort of evaluate those benefits. Um, and then another sort of approach we wanted to take was to show um, that we could possibly replace both the oxygen generation system and the Sabatier reactor by taking a system that could do that reaction I mentioned earlier, um, um, CO2 to methane uh, at a cathode. In that case, you need a source of electrons. So we were just saying, well, let's just use water. That's the simplest way. That, and that'll generate some oxygen. And we'll get the hydrogen ions from that. Now, that involves putting together two systems. Some of the feedback we've gotten from NASA is that uh, the oxygen generation system took 40 years to develop. So it's going to be hard to get them to replace that uh, anytime soon. But I guess we're thinking about you know, going forward in the future. If you really wanted to reduce mass, you might want to uh, rethink how, how those systems actually work. Um, so th this was sort of the uh, uh, a summary of the, of the first project that I mentioned where we were trying to do sort of a multi-output bioelectrochemical system at the, at, the, uh, at the front of the uh, water loop. Um, and the overall benefits in this case would be that um, we would reduce uh, the logistical bur burden, obviously, by closing the loop a little further. We did some operational flexibility. If you're on a long-term mission uh, and you had a system that could generate flexibly different products uh, from a wastewater stream, that might be better than, than having to rebuild uh, or, or you know, carry all your supplies with you. Um, and finally, by, in some cases, generating uh, energy, we could decouple the water system from uh, sort of the energy systems. Um, so this is a, uh, a brief summary. I'm not going to go too too deep into this unless you guys have some uh, some more questions. But um, we basically uh, built a number of cells. You can see some of the cells there. Um, these are pretty simple uh, in, in a lot of ways. They're not the, they're not optimized, uh, you know for all the kind of rates that we wanted to do. But our point was basically two things. We wanted to put ERSATS WPA and UPA water in. ERSATS stands for sort of simulated uh, WPA and UPA water into the systems and show that we could remove the BOD. Uh, and then we also wanted to show that we could switch outputs. Um, and we've got different modes here. EAD stands for enhanced anaerobic digestion. That's our methane generation. Um, MEC stands for microbial electrolysis cell. That's hydrogen generation. And MFC is microbial fuel cell. That's the, that's the actual electricity generation. You can see that, it, that if you look at the top right, we've got sort of a control reactor, which is just a system of the same size, not doing a lot. It's basically just acting as a fermenter, essentially. Uh, and then we've got our EAD, M MEC, and MF MF MEC, and MFC modes. And on the we, on the left, we've got our COD removal rate. And on, all, on, our, on the right, you've got your total uh, uh, organic carbon removal. What you can see is that we're removing uh, over or roughly 70% of the total organic carbon, uh, which is significantly more than the sort of 55 in the control reactor. And we're also able to have a significantly higher COD removal rate um, in our system. So we successfully were treating that. The reason that you can see the current densities that we're achieving on the left there is between 2 and 2.5 amps of current per meter uh, squared of electrode area. The reason they go up and down is that we were putting these through in batch mode. So we were just putting in stuff and leaving it until the current went away, and then putting in more stuff. So essentially, that's, that's the fuel getting consumed um, through the process. 
So this was a pretty successful experiment, we thought, in a lot of ways, and we were excited about it. We were also able to show that we could, in real time, switch between different outputs. So this is an example of one system switching between EAD mode, which is methane generation, with 71% uh, methane, and then going to MEC mode, which is hydrogen generation, with 93% or over 93% hydrogen generation. So we were able to switch in real time between two different outputs of a cell, and this is in one cell that's about this big. So you have something that could be generating electricity, methane, or hydrogen, just with basically a switch of electronics, which we thought was pretty cool. Um, and switch back and you can switch back and forth with the yeah it, it it's all reversible yep absolutely uh, so so then this is kind of a summary summarize I, I didn't go too far into the the last project which is the replacement of the Sabatier reactor but I'm happy to answer that question I don't know if you guys have any other questions um, but in terms of the benefits of the system when you're looking at life support as far as we understand or we would argue that you've got benefits versus sort of chemical technologies or, or filtration, you know, physiochemical approaches. And then you've also got, you can compare it to competing biological approaches because, as I'm sure you guys learned, there's other approaches to sort of uh, treatment that involve bio biology. In general, the biological approaches share uh, a number of factors. One is that they, they can have higher specificity of reactions. Uh, microbes are able to sort of to remove or produce things uh, at a pretty high uh, level of specificity specificity, and that can be more so than in the chemical side. Um, we generally can get to higher loop closure with biological systems for, for a range of region, reasons. Um, that results in a decreased logistics burden. Um, and also, versus particularly pressure-based chemical systems, there is a lot less energy required. And if we're generating some value-added products, that's obviously good. But the, but the main one uh, that I would point out is that we can flexibly generate a range of different products. Uh, with uh, our system versus that's versus both sort of approaches. If you're going to look versus um, biological, our system versus biological processes, I mentioned that we're sort of a biofilm based process. So that's something that is um, uh, particularly good versus sort of free floating biological processes. We're also able to really control the system because we're getting direct electrical feedback in terms of how it's working. So we can tie that. You've got really an integration of the electronics and the controls. So in terms of reliability and robustness, that should give us uh, somewhat of an advantage. Matt, what's yeah. the challenge with respect to radiation? Yeah, um, so so it's a challenge. I, I mean, if we can solve the radiation problem for humans, we can solve it for for the microbes as well. Oh well. Um, so uh, are you saying the microbes are susceptible to radiation? No, I mean, in, in the funny. So it's funny you ask. The, one of the microbes that's most prevalent in the biofilms we use is called geobacter sulfur-reducens. That's actually been found to um, be able to precipitate uranium out of, um, out of water. Uh, and it actually, it, it's, it, it's a kind of a fascinating thing. We actually want to kind of look into it further. But the point is, is that um, radiation is an issue. Um, it's something that, that we definitely should look into. I don't know that it's as big an issue because you're dealing with a huge population of things. I mean, we're talking about galactic cosmic radiation, putting them in a deep space yeah. uh, operation, and you're thinking that the radiation could negatively affect the. the it's possible the that it could, okay. and how much? But some of the things, because it's a living, you know, you're dealing with, you're relying on something that's living. Um, how much? I'm not sure. I mean, if you've got you've got a big population of microbes, and you get a couple of them that are hit by gamma rays or 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 something, that actually may not be a big deal at all. Um, so sort of the long-term impact of radiation is, is we'd have to study that. I guess what I'm thinking is it's not, they're not going to spread once one of them. No, it's not it's like It's not going to spread like a cancer, so right. it won't completely destroy a whole colony of yeah, microbes. that's right. You'll, you'll take out a couple of these guys. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and I think that's something that should be studied. I mean, because, because if, the, if, it, the, if the benefits of loop closure can be so big, particularly as you extend your mission, you're basically going to be weighing, you know, you should you should be weighing that, and then there's ways to get around that in terms of redundancy, uh, and I think just. The names of the head of the pin, like yeah. <laughs> is it then so few of them. Is yeah. it then possible for radiation to severely mutate it into something else? Maybe. So I think I, I think we talked about this, and so that was a, the beginning of a good uh, sci-fi movie right there. 
<laughs> Who knows what you're going to make out of this? But um, no, I think uh, it's possible that it'll get mutated. But I, I, uh, I, you know, the likelihood of it mutating into something that's, you know, useful is probably more likely than unuseful. I don't know. Well, ultraviolet is used for uh, irradiating bacteria, and that's incredibly weak compared to what we're talking about in outer space. I mean, you know, those uh, galactic rays are just going to blast through uh, anything else. The question I have is, it, it seems like really your economics is tied to the concentration of biodegradable material in your waste, right? Because that's, that's where the power comes from. Well, well, yeah, but the the, um, the more biodegrade that that to some extent is true, but that's the the power part of it is only a portion of the overall value. But but, but to finish what but you're given saying, that's a very important part of the value because that's what drives everything. That's your fuel source, right? Yeah, but so the less the less fuel there is, the less of a problem there is, because the less the less wastewater there is, the less concentration of wastewater there is. The less you're worried about that as well. But the less you you generate power. Sure. So there's some there's some issue. In other words, it, it looks like your system is good for higher organic concentrations. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's then it's it. I mean, lower organic. No, you're definitely right. I mean, but when we then then it's all relative, because so when you're talking about um, lower, you have to know you have to know what you mean. The EPA. So for example, take it to back to the earth. The EPA limit. For discharge is 30 milligrams per liter of BOD. Um, for something from 30 to 200 milligrams per liter of BOD, um, we can we can generally remove that and generate some power. For something 200 to 1,000, yeah, we generate a lot more power in that case because we're removing a lot more, and that the economics are better for us there, absolutely. But um, when it, when you talk when it gets down below 30 or so, or when it gets down to 25, then we're really talking about like minuscule currents. But at that point. You don't care because you've treated the water. You, you want to discharge that anyway. Yeah. So, the, so the point is, uh, you really don't want to look for systems that have EPA requirements. You want to look for systems that are high in organic material. You get lots of energy, and you can recycle what you have left. Yeah, and you would want to use something like this in concert with other approaches. Right, you'd have to carbon and, uh, and yeah. other things. Yeah, so, so if you know, if you you know that you do. can get a benefit from the dissolved carbon, whereas it used to be a cost, you might now want to design your water treatment system such that you're putting more dissolved carbon through one of these systems. Then afterwards, you get the, you, there's some trade that you're going to do. You're absolutely right. There's yeah. some trade you're going to do on where the, where the threshold should be. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, have you done any tests on, on uh, salinity, pH, or, or temperature? Or yeah, we've done a lot of a lot of that. So what all I talked about design of experiments is is um, similar for for us in the sense that we have limited resources and we need to look at all these different factors. So we we've definitely done tests on pH, pH salinity, and temperature. We know exactly what temperature we're on at, uh, what the pH ranges should be. Uh, salinity is interesting. Um, salinity actually helps us. So in a lot of these sort of biological based um, uh, approaches salinity is a bad thing, but for us it actually uh, the water becomes more conductive when it's higher in salinity. So the it's a, it's an electrochemical process, so it actually gets better. And how sensitive? Um, it's not any more sensitive than competing approaches. The the ranges are are reasonable. We're basically what we can do is employ sort of what's what's otherwise state of the art in industry to maintain the levels between the ranges that we need. And that's it's it's pretty. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, how, how would you, you know, if you were to, to install this in space uh, and, and to put it and to actually drop the temperatures? Um, you know, by well, you wouldn't actually want to drop temperatures. Actually, you'd want to raise the temperatures exactly. a little bit. Yeah. So what's the ideal temperature for your system? So we have an ideal temperature, which I, which is kind of a trade okay. secret for us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, so we know there is a specific temperature we want to operate it at. Um, if you look at anaerobic digestion. Uh, technologies, which is kind of a similar type of thing, um, those also have an ideal temperature, and you, you generally can use uh, different ways of raising that. You, what you do is you have like dosing pumps. So if you need to affect your pH, you're going to have like an acid and a base. Usually, depending on what you're going to put in there, you only use one or the other. So um, uh, you, there's there's sort of simple state of the art ways to control all of that. But it's uh, it's definitely an issue. So um, okay. 
So there are a couple things that we still need to, to address in terms of reliability, reaction rates, radiation, technical maturity, and then process integration. And I think everyone just raised interesting questions on those themselves. So I wanted to now take a step back and talk about uh, sort of the bigger picture. I know that part of this was to think sort of imaginatively about how these technologies could be applied. This is part of a project we did early on for NASA in which we said, okay, what if you could build a greenhouse uh, on Mars and use sort of the fact that you're growing plants to then generate uh, power in different ways or de generate different value-added products. So this is kind of just a, oops, a, um, a simple idea of having a habitat within a greenhouse, a biomanufacturing facility powered by a microbial fuel cell, which is sort of itself powered by some of the, some of the um, algae that you're generating. And then we've got sort of a greenhouse on the inside of that. See so this? different things that you could, whoops, imagine from that. And then we come over here, and the idea here was that, well, if you're going to have microbial fuel cells up there anyway, you can generate electricity from them. Why not have a, a field that's also growing algae? The algae can be used for protein and food or for fuel. So it's essentially a solar cell because uh, it's consuming carbon dioxide, maybe in situ carbon dioxide, and, and sunlight, uh, and generating oxygen. Uh, and that you can breathe, and then generating fuel for the microbial fuel cell, and then also generating food for the astronauts. So, there's, so we just threw some ideas like that together. It's something that you guys want to see. Um, finally, I just put this in about five minutes ago because someone mentioned a greenhouse. I forgot who it was. Um, are you guys familiar with the Houghton Mars project? Did you guys talk about that at all? So the Houghton Mars project is a project that was started uh, out of NASA Ames to test advanced technologies. Uh, in the Arctic, at the uh, um, basically at the Houghton Mars crater, and um, it's a, it's a pretty cool project in a lot of ways. They go there and they test sort of uh, a lot of different technology, and they also conduct science. Uh, they test spacesuits and things like that. I worked on a project before I got to uh, MIT, um, in which we basically built a, uh, a greenhouse, which was called the Arthur C. Clarke Mars Greenhouse, and the idea was to test autonomous plant growth technologies. And uh, yeah, the idea was to sort of um, you know, at the beginning of the field season, have the have this thing come alive and have the plants grow uh, within it. It was very it was a very cool project in a lot of ways. So we built that and built the control systems for that. So there's people working on Mars greenhouses. Just so you guys know. Um, okay, so uh, what I wanted to do now is just give a very brief uh, demo. And Ollie talked about um, design of experiments. Uh, what, we, what we've done uh, at Cambrian is we kind of have a standardized set of cells. This, so this is actually a microbial fuel cell here. Um, and we just have a, a very standardized process that we put it together. We're actually also selling the kits. They're available on Amazon.com if you guys want to get one. And um, they can be used for science uh, as well as sort of just for, for demonstrating basic concepts associated with sustainability and with the fact that you can go from uh, sort of a waste to a resource. Uh, with, with different kinds of technologies. And so um, one of the ideas that we were talking about with Charlie is that uh, it, one of the things I found in this field um, w is that there's really not a whole lot of uh, standardization of the research. Uh, so there's a lot of different people. The research has kind of exploded uh, in the last 10 years, but people all have their different cells, and you actually can't really compare results. Some people say they've got a power density of you know, 100 watts per meter cubed. Uh, you don't know what that means. How big is the actual system that they're measuring? And if it's scaled, would it still have that same power density? And what would be the power density if they use those microbes in our system? And all those parameters are very different. Um, and I you know, was studying uh, open innovation, sort of collaborative design of complex systems in a way, and thinking a lot about standardization and the value that that can have in term when you're look dealing with a large group trying to design things. Um, and so some something I mentioned, Charlie, I actually think is a really cool opportunity if uh, to do a kind of you know, scientific experiment where you could select, as Ollie said, you know, your levels and your factors, maybe select uh, five or six of each, and then uh, have a number of people uploading the results to a uh, sort of a central database. Um, and this could actually be students. This could be uh, people in high school, in, in college, uh, wherever. And they could be contributing, essentially, uh, to uh, our overall understanding of, of these systems. And then it could be, obviously, any kind of system. But but the idea here, just to show you how this works, is you've got, again, an anode and a cathode. Um, and we've basically put in, in terms of the, what comes with each kit, 
we've got, these are our electrodes in this case. So this isn't what we're actually using all the time, but these are um, basically graphite granules. So they're uh, electrically conductive and they provide a large surface area for the bacteria to grow on. Um, what comes in the kit is, you know, basically your different parts here, you have to assemble it yourself. And um, you put the, the electrodes into the anode and then you've got, this is sort of a, uh, an electrolyte. This is a, an anion or a cation exchange membrane, which will allow for some of the ions to cross over to the other side without allowing the electrons to pass. So this is kind of a key part of the system. You put that in the middle, and then you close it on the other side. In terms of what we put in the anode and cathode, um, I mentioned that it was discovered that a lot of these microbes have these capabilities. We can actually use yeast in these cells, and it actually works. They're not doing a direct electron transfer, but they're doing, uh, if you put in something that's called an electron mediator, they will actually be able to use the mediator. What, what happens there is they're actually oxidizing what you put in here, and in, in this case we're going to put a kind of sugar, uh, and then they're um, reducing the mediator. The mediator then interacts with the electrode and is oxidized by the electrode. That's a slower process. It's not something we would want to do sort of in an industrial setting, but for the purpose of showing the concept, it actually works very well. Um, so you've got a yeast, you've got basically what's uh, a fuel, which is like a sugar, uh, and then you've got, um, this is a phosphate buffer, so someone asked about pH, acid, and, and base. Putting in a buffer is a way to make sure that that gets regulated in, in the proper way. Um, and then you mix it together and basically sort of feed it into, uh, into your anode and feed it into your cathode. Um, and it's very simple. What you end up with is, is a working microbial fuel cell. And um, what you can see if I, let's see. So what we have here is the, um, an anode and a cathode, and there's a potential difference between the anode and the cathode. Um, and here we have 0.7, that's 0.7 volts, right? So that's about what you would expect for a typical fuel cell. The maximum oxidation reduction difference for like a hydrogen uh, fuel cell is like 1.2 volts or something like that, maybe it's right around there. Um, but there's gonna be losses in the cell. So this is the open circuit voltage of this cell is 0.7 volts. And then we've got it connected here to a fan, and you can see as we're able to power the fan. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so this is a system that's actually working and it's it's food in this case is sugar so that's the fuel um, and in terms of yeah I just want to know how much the uh, kits cost so we're selling them for like 200 bucks but we could probably give you a discount if you want um, but we, we're actually looking to drop the cost we're going to be uh, changing some of the materials to make the to make it a lot cheaper so we'll probably get it down below uh, below 100 bucks do we, do we order from you to get a discount? <laughs> you can order, you can send me an email if you want. Or you can order it on Amazon. That would be cool too. Well, we'll get, I'll probably get that email anyway. Um, yeah, for high school teachers, we don't get that much. Money. Yeah, well, it, and no, I mean, if we did, if, um, so we're looking to, to, to get that cost down. But, but I think um, in terms of, the other point I was going to make was uh, in terms of the different sort of experiments that you could do. Um, there's different things that you could vary. What I put there is, you know, you could vary this distance here if you wanted to, sort of the distance between anode cathode. That's one thing you could vary. Um, and I've got one last slide here about that. Sort of, you can vary the fuel that you put in there. That's F. You could vary sort of the length between the electrodes. That's L. You could vary maybe the kind of biology you put in there. If you've got different yeasts, for example, uh, that's something that you could do. And, uh, and all of that should translate to uh, differences in terms of some metrics that you're looking at, um, whether it be you know voltage is one thing you could look at, uh, you could look at total current, or you could do some simple things with like a multimeter. So um, there's it should be a simple number of things, and, and it, frankly, I mean it could be a way to to teach design of experiments as well as kind of sustainability, um, as well as if it was done on a on a bigger scale, it could be it could actually contribute to the field, which I think would be cool. Um, so we use. Sorry? Can we use, like, dirty water? Yeah, dirty water? You could use dirty water, yeah. You could see if it worked. You'd want to characterize what was in it beforehand, maybe. Um, but um, you could use, uh, 
you know, you got to have some sort of organic content in there. Um, and then if it didn't work, it might have some kind of caustic chemical in it. You'd want to make sure you knew that. But um, yeah, you could use you could use Coca Cola, you could use orange juice, you could use lots of different things. That would be really cool. Yeah, cool. I think you so use too. urine if you want. Well, so that's actually an interesting question. So Does that work with yeast? Urine uh, and urine is actually high in ammonia, right, and low in COD. And so urine is actually a difficult one because you'd want to nitrify and denitrify urine. So it's tough. But it might work a little bit. Yep. Um, what's the lifetime of these microbes? The lifetime? Yeah. Like how long do they actually live? Yeah. The, you know, that's a good question. Their doubling time is on the order of half a day to a day. Um, when they actually die, I don't know, because they can be maintained in stasis for very long periods of time. Right. Um, and the biofilms themselves is more kind of what we care about. Mm -hmm. And those can have a very long lifetime. We've operated them for years. Okay. So Over a year. I guess, what's the design life of one of these things? That's going to be dictated less by the microbes and more by the other materials that you're putting in there. So for the industrial setting, and then, I mean, the design lifetime is also a function of, of you know what setting you're going to use it in. You mm. can do things like design for maintainability, you know, and, right. and uh, maintenance. Mm. That's something we think a lot about. We're expecting to have to switch out the in, in like industrial scale systems. Uh, the most critical thing are the are the electrodes, mm -hmm. and then there's going to be the biofilm on them. Mm -hmm. So we're designing this so that you can switch those out pretty easily. And do you have a feel for how often you'd have to switch them out? Probably, I would say about once a year. I assume Bruce Logan is the one you're working with? Yeah, so he's, he's one of our advisors, yeah, okay. absolutely. For the uh, trip to Mars or anything like that, I just want to make it clear, or maybe you can clarify it, your system is not a standalone system. Your system does not guarantee total recycle, pure water. You're, you're an important component in that. Absolutely. But there's other things you have to do to clean up the water, yeah. like activated carbon or something else. Right. So, so if you, yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, you'd probably want to do something on the pre-treatment side of things post as well. Side, yeah. yeah. And then you put in the pre and post. But yeah. You're touting that it's a way to greatly reduce the uh, carbon and claim energy. Yeah. For the bulk of the dissolved carbon that you want to reduce and some of the solids, um, I would argue it's a, it's a pretty effective way to do that mm -hmm. while also capturing some of the value in that. Yeah, it's a clever way to do it, but I want to make sure that everybody here understands. Yes, it's not. It's an important component, but it's not the whole deal. Totally, yeah, okay. yeah. And you need to do pre-treatment and post-treatment and think about a complete system design. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, if you were going to experiment with that, how do you go about, like, changing one of the variables? Do you have to take out the whole thing and then put a whole new set of, like, electrodes back in? Yeah, you, you probably would. Um, you know, what you could do is you would do like an experimental run, and then you'd have to kind of probably take it apart and clean it and redo it just to make sure that you had actual distinction. So you can just clean it and then use it again. You don't have to have brand new. No, yeah, you can just clean it. Bobs. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that some kinds of waste, like for example, urine, it wouldn't really work very well with because of the ammonia content. I was wondering, in the first sort of slide that you had, that it's upstream inside the ISS system. What kind of, what is the proportion of material in that wastewater, realistically, that is useful in terms of organic material that is converted into energy? On the ISS, it's not a terribly large amount because what they're putting into the water loop is pretty low in dissolved carbon. Okay. It, they're putting in like UPA distillate urine processing assembly distillate, which has some, and then they're putting in like humidity condensate, okay. uh, and then a couple other things. So what we had in terms of our SATS simulation was relatively low in, ter in terms of the dissolved carbon. It did also have some of those other things that, that aren't as good. Um, but uh, I was wondering, what if you went with the option of completely redesigning the loop? Like, yes. what is the best case scenario? Like, just wondering. So that's what I think needs would need to be done. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't want this this system with the ISS water loop is not up is not optimized necessarily, and there's some redundancies in there. 
So you'd want to completely redesign the loops. Uh, as, and I think what you would also want to do is integrate the, uh, the oxygen uh, generation system and some of the other, the carbon dioxide scrubbing as well. So one of the things, for example, if you could, if you could put on one side sort of a higher carbon wastewater stream, and on the other side you could have on, on the cathode the CH4, CO2 reduction to CH4, um, that would actually be, that's not currently done at all in terms of, of being linked up, but that would actually be a really cool sort of, now in terms of what the COD of the stream that you ultimately would put in there based on that redesign, your guess is as good as mine at this point. I mean, it, it really depends on a lot of factors and, and a range of different things, so. Yeah. Matt, uh, you're, you're providing a biofilm on the electrode and, uh, automat with the system. If you change the, the microbe, different results, right? Yeah. So you, you're, you're particularly looking at one type of microbe. Would the students be able to try to look at other kinds of microbes, or? Yeah. So what we're to be clear, what we're actually doing in the in the lab is we actually have a population of microbes. So we have a mixed consortium of of, uh, of different bugs. Now, you could. There's two ways to answer your question. One is, could you do a pure culture based thing? Yes, you could. Pure cultures are are difficult to deal with, mm -hmm. and generally the difficulty is that. Um, the microbes will tend to be outcompeted uh, by other existing microbes, so you just need to be very careful about that. If it, it needs to, okay, so, so it's it's a bunch of different kinds of microbes. It's actually what we use is a bunch of different kinds of microbes, and what that does is it becomes very stable okay. as a biofilm. Um, but you could definitely look to seed the 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 electrode with different kinds of microbes, and you could look to to put yeah different microbes in there. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Pat, uh, Pat, could you go back to the chart that had the um, the cycles, you know, on the multi on the multi output? The, oh, the chart. Of yes, the I'm just thinking, uh, you know, for the high school, for the high schools, you know, um, because you, on your on your uh, kit, you have those little valves, right? Those little outlet valves. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, you're, you're showing it normally. You don't. You're not telling us how many hours that is. But I'm just curious if you could describe. Uh, you, I think you described the. You described the setup, the initial setup of the fuel cell very well. But then, how would it actually but then, operate? But then, you know, think uh, if we if we put ourselves into uh, a high school chemistry lab like yours. Um, mm -hmm. No, you know, would, would this be one cycle a day, and then the students would come in before their other classes in the morning? Yeah. And they do the switch out, or it's, how it, do we imagine that? It depends on how you want to operate it, but generally it's going to take a couple of weeks for the bugs to get sort of ramped up and working. So in the beginning, the cycle times are going to be slow. So you'll put something in, and you'll wait maybe, you know, four or five days, and then you'll put something else in, and you'll wait maybe four or five days. And you can monitor sort of the, the electrical output during that process. When you see it start to go down, you put <coughs> you put more uh, back in, and those cycles, as the process goes on, should get shorter and shorter because the fuel gets consumed faster and faster. At the fastest, it really depends on how what the concentration you put on the inside. So once you've standardized that, you can get it down to be about once a day. Uh, if and and that's something we typically look at like once or twice a day, to once every two days. It depends on what we're actually trying to test. But um, we haven't actually. It's a good question because. We haven't actually, you know, um, operated this with a lot of people who don't know how to use it. We've actually sold a couple of these to research labs um, because we're using them for research, uh, and we sold them to, you know, but and and it, there's been a few sort of just general inquiries, but we haven't actually had the, you know, complaints yet about this thing isn't easy to use and how can I use it better? So it's it's a important thing to think through. Um, I have a question. Um, Dealing with kids and 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 all that, I assume that you made it safe. But what's the worst thing that could happen? Can you just play with it. It's all pretty safe. The worst thing that could happen is that they drink the catholite. No, I mean that wouldn't. Don't would, have them drink the catholite. <laughs> what what about the, the the microbes? Would that cause any? Problems? No, the microbes is yeast. In this case, it's yeast. So it's uh, it, and that's through an indirect process with with the yeast. Yeah, but um, but it's pretty safe. So these aren't, these aren't your actual microbes. No. Okay, I got you. So what we're this is just for the purpose of the of the kit, 
But, um, and, and what you find is that particularly where you're using indirect processes, a lot of microbes have these capabilities. Um, and, but for the direct processes, it's a little slower to build a biofilm. It takes a little bit more technique and, and all that. So. Well, Matt, thank you so much. This was really inspiring. Thank you.